Hello and welcome to the Erlang Solutions monthly webinar. My name is Martin Milikšić and I'm the Solutions Director here at Erlang Solutions. Today's webinar represents a continuation of a series of webinars we have been running across topics of interest in the world of Erlang and dealing with solutions based on the Erlang programming language. Today specifically we will be talking about Wombat OAM, the latest technology we have developed here at Erlang Solutions. Now Wombat came out of years of feedback we have persistently been receiving from our customers, telling us time and time again that whilst benefiting from their Erlang systems, in actuality they had very limited visibility into their Erlang nodes and clusters. We therefore built Wombat to address this challenge and to take over the monitoring and management of any Erlang system, allowing for complete transparency into its workings and performance and enabling proactive responses to any issues starting to develop in the system. So Wombat OAM is effectively an operations and maintenance tool collecting over 100 pieces of metrics from across the Erlang nodes and clusters, posting notifications, raising alarms as needed, orchestrating, injecting code and managing deployment. Today's talk will provide you with the very fine detail of the inner workings and capabilities of Wombat as well as a demo showcasing these capabilities. As with any, any live event, please excuse any technical issues we may face today. Just to start by telling you a bit about Erlang Solutions, we are a products and services oriented company. We are completely devoted to the Erlang programming language and since our founding in 1998, we have worked with organizations and individuals using Erlang, helping evolve the language and supporting people and businesses using it. Today, we have about 80 people across offices in London, Stockholm, Krakow, Budapest and Seattle and working on interesting Erlang projects across the globe. We are very keen on creating value and competitive advantage for our customers across sectors and through the unique features and characteristics of Erlang as a language. We are also equally uh, very ambitious in developing Erlang based products and some of those products include our Mongoose IM messaging platform, the React distributed data store and of course Wombat OAM as well as other solutions applicable across sectors and problem areas where Erlang makes sense. Now I'm very pleased to say that our speakers today are Francesco Cesarini, the founder of Erlang Solutions and its technical director, and Chava Hock, the lead developer on Wombat OAM. Please allow me to finish by saying you are welcome to post questions throughout the duration of the webinar. You can use the chat facility on the webinar's interface for that purpose. Our speakers, uh, Francesco and Chava, will answer as many of your questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. If any questions do go unanswered, please raise them via email using the following address, webinar at erlang-solutions.com. If you're interested in learning more about Wombat OAM or Erlang in general, or just wish to establish whether they could be a solution for the challenges your own business may be facing, by all means get in touch with us, contact me directly. My email address will be displayed in one of the final slides of the presentation that we will share with you today. The same goes for any other questions you may have, feel free to contact us. I would now like to hand over to Francesco and Chava who will be glad to start us off. Hi, my name is Francesco Cesarini, I'm the Founder Technical Director here at Erlang Solutions. Hi, Hello. I'm Chaba, Chaba Hock, I'm behind Wombat's architecture and now I'm working on deploying nodes with Wombat on different clouds and making sure that it scales to tens of thousands of nodes. Okay, so you know, the, the idea for Wombat started you know, when I was spent about a year helping an operations team in a large company increase the uptimes of the system and optimizing and customizing the way they do things. And every time there was an outage, you know, we put a lot of thought into what could have been done better. You know, and every time we got woken up in the middle of the night to address an issue, you know, we made sure that never happened again. And you know, the experiences uh, we had in that department, in that organization, uh, managing Allen clusters are no different than the experiences you find in any other uh, organization, no large or small. And you know, from our end at Erlang Solutions, we have customers scattered all over the world. And a lot of what I do is you know, spent a lot of, a lot of, large part of my job, apologies, is you know, traveling around the world and speaking to these customers. You're know, trying to understand their needs and issues. And you know, a typical problem we see is a typical problem we see is uh, the, no, the, not the notions or the outputs of a hero programmer. 
you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a system out there in four weeks. But, you know, the big thing which, you know, the big question mark you need to ask yourselves is what happens once you've gone live? And, you know, from our end, you know, we've run projects where you know, documentation alone took months to write. So, you know, if we go in and we set aside the arguments that, uh, you know, Aaron and Code is self-documentary, you know, we need to start figuring out and ask ourselves other question. Uh, is the developer, you know, supporting the system uh, the one who gets woken up in the middle of the night uh, when issues arise. You know, how do you know you are experiencing issues in the first place? Uh, is it the result of your customers calling in saying they can't access a service? Or, you know, when operations actually go in and, you know, when they receive the first call that there is an issue, you know, have operations already been working on it, you know, trying to resolve it and address it? Are they already aware of it? And Assuming you've got all of your support issues in place, you know, uh, and I'm thinking live tracing, audit trails, statistics, and visibility, you know, how much code was actually written? How much new code was actually written? Um, you know, if you have all of your OAM uh, libraries in place and infrastructure in place, all you need to you know, do is reuse them from one project to another and only focus on the business logic itself. Another notion you know, we have to explain is you know, the myth of the nine nines availability. And indeed, you know, Ericsson have, have achieved nine nines availability in some of the systems over a certain period of time. And you know, to be frank, I'm sure you know, others have also achieved 100% availability those days, you know, there was no service outage. Uh, truth is, you know, not everyone has unlimited budgets and teams with hundreds of developers. And usually, you know, what we tend to argue is, you know, five nines when it comes to airline is much more realistic. Uh, you know, five nine, Five nines equates to about three minutes of downtime per year. Now, to achieve five nines, however, is not easy. And you need to implement preemptive support. Uh, you need full visibility of what's going on in your system. And you need to have the capability of resolving issues before they escalate and cause an outage. Uh, you need systems which react to failure, systems which self-heal, and ensure that there's no single point of failure. You know, so whilst you can achieve you know, five nines at a fraction of the cost of other technologies, it still comes as a cost and there's still work behind it. You know, thinking that you know, using airline and everything else will kind of magically resolve itself doesn't really work that way. And many of the issues you, know, you will face are not necessarily software related. You, know, you have power backup. Uh, what happens if the network administrator trips over uh, a network cable and messes up a firewall configuration? Or you know, what happens if your heart hard disk fails. You know, the largest part of issues occur during live upgrades. Uh, live upgrades and software upgrade during runtime is great, but even there, it, it, all comes, uh, it all comes at a cost. So, you know, when earlier on, you know, I queried, you know, how much new code was written in a four-week project, you know, I was referring to libraries which include metrics, alarming, logging. You know, as well as you know, listing a lot of other reusable OTP applications and components. You know, I was you know, talking about the whole idea of reusable components, which will also provide hooks into your existing operation and maintenance infrastructure. And if you look at what's available out there today, you know, there are a lot of homegrown solutions for monitoring and management. And they'll all have their advantages and disadvantages. You know, Nagus, for example, has a plugin, but it only covers the very basic functionality. Falsum and Exometer are you know, libraries which will connect your business metrics, uh, but you still need to capture this data and store it somewhere. You still need to aggregate your business metrics with your system metrics. And you know, another example uh, is NTOP. NTOP shows real-time processing info, you know, such as a number of reduction, but you know, there is no history of peak analysis. So if your systems crash, you know, how do you manage your post-mortem debugging? How do you actually see the peaks which, you know, maybe led up to the crash. And, you know, finally, you know, how many tools out there are focused on airline clusters? You know, how, you know, what tools do you have to configure them to handle orchestration, auto scaling capability, and capability-based deployment in hybrid clouds? Or, you know, something as simple as automated software updates. You know, there's not much. You know, Shabab, over to you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Francesco. I would just like to spell out how uh, the visibility and the operations part translate to Bombard. So in Bombard's case, uh, and well in all cases, visibility means that you see what's going on inside your system. And in Bombard's case, 
it means you see what's going on inside your LLM VMs, your LLM nodes. And what Wombat does is when it connects to your nodes, it starts collecting metrics, notifications, and alarms from these nodes. And you can use this data to both prevent the failures from happening, and also if they do happen, then you can use this data to investigate why this happened to prevent it from happening again. Um, fortunately, um, if you have a big system, you probably already have some tools that you use for monitoring them, and you don't have to throw them out in that case, because you can integrate Bomba into your existing infrastructure, meaning that all the data that's collected by Bomba will be pushed over to your system so that you can view your data in the way that you are accustomed to. So that's the visibility part. And the other aspect with which Wombat uh, can help is the operations part. And that means that you want to have a method for deploying your LLM system. You want orchestration, meaning that you want the deployment to proceed in the way that's uh, the best for you. You want to be able to manage the configuration of your system. For instance, you see that something bad is going on in a few nodes, so you want to change the lag at low level, you want to lower it, so you get more information about those nodes, um, or, or you really, really want to uh, set some configuration value to be used in the future. And that's the operations part. This webinar will focus on the visibility part of Fombot, with a few little glasses at the operations part. Over to you, Francesco. Yeah, so, you know, what is Wombat? And, you know, before giving you a more, you know, concrete definition of what Wombat is, um, you know, I want to go into detail into, you know, one of, well, into a few of the many stories which uh, inspired Wombat in the first place. And, you know, we had a system which was handling thousands of transactions per second. And in this system, uh, a member of the operations team tried to solve an issue by patching an airline module. He went in, he compiled it, he loaded it into the airline VM. And you know, quickly realized it didn't solve the problem he thought he would solve, and went ahead and deleted the beam file from the patches directory. You know, what he didn't realize is that the beam module was still loaded in the Aaron VM, and so the, the code he patched was still running. Now, in this particular case, you know, taking down or rebooting the system was not an option. You know, there are tens of thousands of requests being handled in that system at any one time. And not only we didn't know if rebooting the system would have solved or addressed the issue. Uh, the result is, you know, a developer ended up wasting a whole week, you know, before he realized that the version of the module in the system was not the one that was originally for running. And not only this system had this particular system had thousands of installations all over the world. It had really good visibility and really strict procedures which uh, staff had to follow. But in the middle of the night. Obviously, they weren't being followed. It's human nature. You try to solve a problem through trial and error as quickly as possible, you know, so you can go back to sleep. And, you know, how would Wombat have helped uh, in this case? Well, first of all, every shell command in Wombat would have generated a notification and have been logged centrally. The engineer who would be the call would have been able to remotely view the complete shell history of uh, this particular, um, you know, this particular operations staff and as well as a shell history in every other node. And every time a new node is loaded in the system, a new module sorry, is loaded in the system, another notification would have been generated. And finally, module versions are closely monitored. You know, this particular system had nodes running the same release. That would have meant that these nodes would have had to run the same version of that module. Instead, you know, what happens with Wombat is by monitoring the modules, if two modules running in nodes of the same type differ, an alarm is raised. And you know, this is one of the many things where, you know, these five days you know, of troubleshooting could have been spared um, when dealing with it. So, you know, what is Wombat? Um, Wombat is an operation and maintenance tool for airline-based systems. And what it does, it gives you full visibility on what is going on into your airline clusters, either as a standalone product or by integrating it into your OEM infrastructure. And as an example, uh, you know, Here's a, just a high-level overview of, of your Wombat architecture, but the way it works is that Wombat will you know, provide interfaces to Zabbix, Graphite, Cacti. Uh, we are implementing an SNMP interface to connect tools such as HBO, Review, and just standard MIPS. 
uh, Nagios being another one. Uh, we can access also one but through a REST API, which is uh, keeping the door open for uh, you know, tablet-based PCs or mobile apps. And for those who don't have anything in place, we're providing a simple web GUI, which is what we're going to demonstrate today, which you know, gives you access to the full visibility of the system. And the way, you know, the way um, it works is that in, in, in Wombat, you actually go in and you start providing a node name and a cookie. And Wombat will automatically connect itself to this particular node, visualize what's in there, and based on the applications which are running in, in that particular node, inject agent code. So no, basically no uh, extra work needs to be done. No, you don't need to include any Wombat specific uh, applications into your system. So even if your system has been live for a few years, you can still start deploying Wombat and start connecting to it and getting full visibility. So you know, let me give you a few examples over what you have with Wombat. Now, you know, Here's an example of memory usage, and you know, you'd be surprised over how many or few systems have this ability of how memory in the Allen virtual machine is actually being used. You know, if, for example, your node runs out of memory uh, or no historical data exists, you know, showing you the crash as a result of memory leak, which happens over time, or a result of a free process spike, so you, won't, you, you, you don't have the information which shows you what has happened uh, resulting in this memory crash. And what you see here is a graph you know, plotting the memory usage. And we can see a few spikes you know, happening after uh, 3 p.m. You know, the metrics are consolidated and aggregated. Um, you know, we consolidate uh, metrics to basically be able to reduce the space needed you know, to store uh, longer intervals. And we aggregate them to be able to go in and start correlating metrics uh, between each other. What you can do is you can go in and configure intervals, um, you know, the default interval being 15 minutes, uh, an hour, a day, and a week. Uh, we also recently have, you know, we also recently have added live metrics, which means that, you know, you can actually be plotting live metrics, which are updated every few, every couple of seconds. Shaba, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, can you go over to the next slide? Thank you. So, Wombot has different um, groups of functionality. It collects metrics, alarms, and notifications from the nodes. And what I'd like to point out regarding these groups of functionalities are the similarities between them and the common themes. So, one of the common themes is that um, Wombat automatically starts collecting all this data, metrics, alarms, and notifications, once it connects to a node. And after collecting this data, or during collecting it, um, it will store all this data in its own database. It has a REST interface, and it makes all this data available via its REST interface. It also has a web dashboard, which uses the REST interface. So you can very conveniently visualize all this collected information. If you have a, another system, Graphite, Zebix, or uh, Nagios, or whatever, then that's another way to get all this data visualized. The other common theme between metrics, alarms, and notifications is the sources, how they are collected. So if you have an alarm node, then you, you may not produce any metrics, alarms, or notifications if you haven't thought about operations a lot. But even then, Wombat will collect over 100 metrics about the alarm VM and many alarms and many notifications. The other source of information is if you decide that you know the metrics, alarms, and notifications that are important for your system and you want to generate them. And in that case, you can use OTP's built-in solutions. For example, you can use the SASL alarm handler to manage your alarms, and you can use the SASL error handler to manage your log entries. And then you use these systems. Wombat will automatically pick up your alarms and notifications or error log entries and um, collect them just like it would collect its own built-in data. The third way to generate your data is to use third-party libraries. 
source from indexometer are open source uh, metric collection libraries. LR for ELAN is uh, similar for alarms, and Lager is similar for logs. And in our cases, if you use these libraries on your nodes, you don't have to know anything on your node about Wombat, but when you connect these nodes with Wombat, Wombat will pick up all this data and show it to you. And finally, if uh, you have a homegrown solution for pending all these operations data, then you can use our plugin infrastructure to implement your own way of producing matrix alarms and notifications. Over to you, Francesco. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I like telling stories. Um, you know, one of the many stories is a system uh, which was running out of memory at regular intervals. And when we went in and started investigating, we realized that in order to save memory, or at least they believed they were saving memory, uh, the user were converting phone numbers to atoms, thinking that oh, we just pass in an integer in reference to the atom table around uh, and use less memory. And what was happening is all they were seeing were processes unable to allocate memory and you know, the whole node crashing. And you know, some of the metrics we have will, will include all the different types of memory usage. So you know, some of the metrics will we'll have system memory, the allocated atom memory, so how, many, how much memory is actually set aside for atoms, and how much of the atom memory is actually being used, um, how much memory is the code using, the ETS tables, ports, as well as you know, the memory being used by the processes themselves. And you know, had this team had that access to these metrics, they would have seen that, you know, by default, that all the process memory was stable over time. And taking it further, you know, they would have started aggregating the data, and they would have seen an increase in the total memory usage, which you know, eventually runs out of memory. And this increase would have been over time, as well as an increase in the atom memory itself. And you know, the way you know, forward would have been you know, to correlate that with you know, the number of atoms, you know, that's another uh, metric we pull in regularly, and which we take in you know, by looking at the atom table size. And you know, they would have solved this issue in no time. Uh, possibly you know, with some of the alarming, they would have actually gone in and been able to realize that they were running out of memory and you know, tried to address it before the node itself crashed. You know, on the metric side, you know, we have metrics on distribution, ports, sockets, modules, you know, process information such as garbage collection, message queues, process state, as well as reductions. And we're actually breaking down on a process level um, information on an application level of granularity. That means you know, you're able to see which applications are using the most resources. For your business metrics, as Chava mentioned, you know, Folsom and Exometer, or you, know, you can collate your own, uh, your own business metrics with the standard airline VM ones. So you're able to go in and look at the number of users which are logged in and try to map it based on you know, your memory usage. You know, even alarms, you know, most alarms will have a story behind it as do notifications. And you know, see an alarm as a form of warning in your system highlighting a particular issue. You know, when the issue is resolved, the alarm is cleared. So you know, an example of an alarm could be an 80% is full alarm. Uh, you know, it's something you want to address before the disk becomes completely full. And you go in, you delete some of the files, get your usage under 80%, and the alarm will automatically be cleared. And you know, your alarms by default will have different severities, usually warning, minor, and major. And you know, depending on the severity of these alarms, you can go in and generate triggers. And these triggers could result in a pager call, an SMS being sent, or an email. Um, and you know, they could be generated when raising, when being raised, or when being cleared. In total, you know, we've got about 25 alarms in place right now, and new ones are being added uh, in every sprint. And you know, just to give you one of the many stories, you know, uh, at one point, uh, one of the operations team messed up a firewall configuration. You know, it happens all the time. Uh, what happened in this particular instance is that you know, tens of thousands of users uh, were pressing the refresh button to trying to reaccess the service, and they weren't able to get through. They, they noticed very quickly that, uh, you know, that um, you know, there was an issue with the firewall. They fixed it, uh, but by the time they fixed it, the number of users pressing the refresh button had grown to a stage that the node handling these requests got got a massive number of requests, and you know, for every request, we were spawning a new process. And by default, the system limit for number of processes had not been changed. And this resulted in node crashing and all of the users being kicked out. So all of a sudden, you had a set of users, and you're pressing refresh one more time, hitting the second node. 
and you know killing it and then you know, hitting the third note basically and killing it you know basically creating a cascading failure now this was a while ago no no today you know uh, not only handle many more processes than you know 50 60000 but hitting the limit will not cause a crash of the vm anymore you know regardless of, of it you know having you know there are alarms which you know when you reach 80% of your process limit it's raised and when you hit 90% the severity of it is raised to, to a major alarm. And, you know, going in and looking, you know, and seeing how close you, you get to reaching this process limit will help you know, put in place preemptive measures and help you with your capacity planning. Or, you know, another example of alarms is the process whose message queue is growing too long. You know, it's often a warning that, you know, producers are producing requests faster than the consumer can handle them. And you know, when this happens, you know, an alarm is raised, uh, and if the message queue gets longer, the severity is increased. And you know, clearing it once the alarm also get cleared. And you know, why message queues grows, you know, that's very system dependent. But at least we're going and we are alerting users of it. Another example of alarming in a live system: a support engineer went in and executed a tap to list call in the shell. Uh, and what he, he was doing when inspecting the data, trying to resolve and address a particular issue. And what he didn't think was that the table uh, he was you know, calling tap to list on contained about a million entries. Entries. He used you know, the instances in the table, he fixed the issue, and he exited the shell, and that was it. Not thinking more about it. Until a few months later, someone else came along and did exactly the same thing. But, you know, this, the difference is that the second time around, the user caused that particular node to crash. And you know, the issue here was with the shell history. Every time you execute a command in the errand shell, the results are stored in the shell process. And that meant that the node, at this point in time, ended up having three copies of a table with millions of elements, and it didn't have you know, enough memory to handle them. So you know, one of the lines we have, is, you know, which comes and works by default, is if your shell, uh, shell history if your shell size you know, becomes too large, an alarm is created and generated, and you're then giving the tools to go in and clear it, and you clear it remotely without having to access the shell itself. We also, you know, we've got alarm from eLarm, which is an open source airline module which generates alarm, and the Sassel alarm handler, and they're all retrieved by default, and you can retrieve your own alarms you know, when writing your own customized plugin modules. You know, another example is so you look at notifications, you know, a lot of users have hundreds of nodes in production, and you'll be surprised to hear that most of, for most of them, the only way to know that a node P behavior has crashed and restarted is to log onto the machine, connect to the Aaron node, and start the Sassel report browser. And the irony of it all is that operations will not give developers access to these machines. So, you know, you have systems which heal, but you can do preemptive support and avoid failures by looking at what's actually going wrong. And you know, notifications are also, you know, in these cases, are only used, you know, for most uh, post-mortem uh, examinations of the system. And if something goes wrong, you could look at these notifications, you know, to resolve them. But, you know, just, just like metrics, you know, if you, your system crashes now, Wombat goes in and it will retrieve all of your, all of your uh, crashes and error reports into one place, you know, through a web GUI where they can be viewed and monitored. And you know notif notifications we handle include you know system monitors um, you know such as ports being busy, um, it, including the distributed airline port. It sometimes is known to hang if there's a large message going through. If the process is spending too large garbage collecting or it has an unusually large memory spike, you know we'll raise notifications. Schedulers going to sleep or waking up. You know as well as you know shell commands being typed in, applications being started. You know, code modules being purged or, or loaded. You know, Shaba, anything to add? No, not really at this point. Okay. So, you know, continuing, um, what we have here is, yeah, you know, I'll just give you a quick overview over some of the screenshots after which, you know, Shaba will go in and give you a, a give you more, you know, detailed demo over, over Wombat. Now, here is you know, the adding of a new node. All you see is you only need to do is add in a node name, and um, one button will accept both long names and short names. You add in a cookie, and if you click Discover Connecting Nodes and press Add Node, it will go in and traverse all of the nodes, trying to find out which of the nodes um, 
you know, with what nodes are part of the cluster and then automatically connect to them, inject agent code and start monitoring them. So in this particular example, we've connected to a real cluster consisting of five nodes. And Wombat itself, you know, eat your own dog food, Wombat's an airline node, and it, so Wombat is being monitored as well through you know, using Wombat. There's a graphical topology of the system which can be seen. In this case, you know, we've got our system or a cluster which consists of two node types. One is the RIA cluster, one is the RIA node type, and the other is the Wombat node type. And the yellow nodes here, as we see, are nodes which where we're currently visualizing information. This is basic information which we're seeing right now. Um, much more detailed information is being added as we go along. Metrics, we've got, uh, you know, metrics will include counters and gauges as the simplest one on one end of the scale and more complex ones such as histograms, meters and spirals. Here we've got uh, an example of live metrics, so metrics which is being updated every second. And you know, what's interesting here is you know, we're seeing the blue line here, which is the total memory consumption, and we're seeing the green line here, which is the system memory. And we're seeing in the blue line there's a spike, and by adding and being able to view process memory, we're seeing that the spike is caused by an increase of the memory used by the processes themselves. So just an example on how data can be correlated to try to figure out and seeing what's wrong. Here's another example, um, even here, of you know, binary memory, a process memory, and the total memory being used. And this example is also being mapped here to cacti, and where you know, information is being pulled in by cacti and visualized in cacti. And this you know, cacti would then allow you to visualize your, your system metrics and metrics from other, other parts of the system. You know, it could be OS metrics or metrics from other systems which interface towards it, which are not necessarily written in that way. Alarming, this is the alarming window. Um, we, when alarms are cleared, we basically go in and show, you know, show that you know, they've been cleared. In this case, there were three nodes which had crashed or had been terminated. When the node came back up, the node down alarm was cleared. We're also seeing another alarm, which is old code minor. So old code means that you've got two versions of the code in the system. You've got the old version and the new version. And you know, this can be dangerous because if you've got processes running the old version of the code, um, you know, next time you do a code upgrade, those processes will be terminated by default. So this will give you a warning that you need to go in and purge your old code, you know, free the memory they're using. And if purging code won't clear the alarm, that means as a process running it, you need to do a, you know, you can't, you know, you need to hard, you, you need to terminate those processes when it's doing it. You're also seeing alarms where, you know, the disk is running out of space. Notifications, uh, we're pulling in, you know, apart from the system notifications of which there are about 20 or 25 right now, we're also pulling in all the notifications from the SASL log handler as well as logger right here. Okay, Shaba, over to you for the demo. Do you, you have anything to add? Do you have anything to add to what I've said? No, I will add what I have to add during the demo. Excellent. So, can you see the Wombat web dashboard? Francesco, can you see the Wombat web dashboard? Uh, no. No. Me. Yes, here it is now. Perfect. Yeah. And what about now? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great. So, in order to beat Murphy, um, we recorded a video showing Wombat's web dashboard, and I'm going to use this video to demonstrate Wombat's features. So, on the top of the dashboard, you see that there are different tabs. Topology, metrics, notification, alarms, and orchestration. And uh, these tabs represent the different groups of functionalities that we have. Today, we are going to talk about first four from topology to alarms. Topology means the set of nodes that are handled by Wombat. Here, you see that we have two node families. RIOC 147 is the first family with five React nodes, all of them in upstate, and we have the Wombat node itself in another node family. As Francesco already mentioned, since Wombat is just an analog node, it can be managed by Wombat by itself. 
If I click on a node, then Bomba shows me some details about the node. For example, this is the UID that uh, Bombot assigned to this node. Each node in Bombot is um, identified with uh, IDs like this one. If I would like to add the node, then this is the form that I can use. There are two ways to add the node. In both cases, I have to type the node name and the cookie. The difference is whether I check the checkbox below the discover connected nodes. If I don't check it, then Wombat will use Erlang distribution to connect to this node using this cookie. So when I press add node, then I get a new node, as you see in the left. The other mechanism is that if I have a whole cluster of nodes that I want to add to Wombat, then I select one of the nodes and type the name of that node. The nodes in the cluster have to use the same cookie, and I type that cookie. And I say that I want to add not only the node whose name I typed, but also the whole cluster, all the other nodes with which this node is connected. So when I add node, add the node, then what happens is that Wombat connects to this node, asks it for its neighbors, it connects to all its neighbors as well, and then connects to them, uh, connects to the neighbors of the neighbors, and so on. So it relatively discovers the whole network of nodes. I can not only add a node, but obviously I can also remove a node. And I can even remove a node family. So that's about the topology. Now let's have a look at metrics. There are different ways to collect metrics and different ways to visualize them. And there are even different kinds of metrics. Francesco mentioned that there are histograms and uh, numeric metrics and spirals and meters. So because of these different combinations, we have different subtabs here from numeric metrics to live metrics. But today we are going to have a look at only the numeric metrics, which are the most simple ones. On the left, you see the same nodes and node families. If you want to have a look at the metrics of a node, you click on the node, and there you see metric categories, from memory down to fossil metrics. There are two kinds of metrics uh, in Wombat at this high level. There are built-in metrics, which, are, which go from memory to system stats. And there are custom metrics, which are represented here only by the fossil metrics group. The first, the first category, uh, from memory to system stats, in the built-in metrics category, we have metrics that are automatically collected by Wombat, no matter uh, what your node has or does. In the fossil metrics category, on the other hand, um, we collect those metrics that your application produces. So if I open the memory category, for example, then we see that there are around 10, uh, 10, 10 concrete metrics. So when I select total memory, then on the other side, we will see the total memory metric as collected from this node, minute by minute, in the last hour. If I select another metric, then I will see another metric. Often, it's useful to visualize different metrics at the same graph. For example, if uh, I see that total memory is used for something, and I want to see what it is used for, then I can put up total memory and all the different kinds of memories. And in this example, we see that um, most of the total memory is used for the system memory. So I don't have to investigate the processes, for example. And you see that even the bump is at the same place in these two memory types. The other metric that I would like to show you is one of my favorite metrics. It's the message queue length metric. And I like this metric because it was actually used to discover and fix a bug. 
And the story is that we have a load testing tool developed here at Ella Solutions, and they use Bombard to monitor their nodes. And they were using it happily, um, checking all the metrics, and they saw what they didn't expect, that the message queue length was going up and up. The message queue length metric shows the summary of the length of all the process queues in the system. So that meant that some processes were filling up their message queues. They were getting messages and not processing them. And they didn't even, uh, they didn't think that uh, this could be a problem in their system, but afterwards when they saw this graph, they were able to uh, find the process that was causing the problem and they were able to fix it. So that's about built-in metrics. We have over a hundred, so I don't want to go through all of them. Um, let's have a look at foursome metrics. The React node uses foursome to generate a bunch of metrics that it thinks are interesting. For example, the React KB pre-commit fail metric tells us how many times React failed to execute a pre-commit hook. Unfortunately, the number is zero because it never failed. In order to make it easier for you to imagine how this foursome thing works, that you put a metric in, in your own, own node, but it's still connect, collected by one bot, uh, I, will, I will show you an example. So we'll connect to our test node with an Erlang shell, and we are going to use foursome to first create a new counter, which I called cars. Not that it has any meaning, but we haven't had such a, uh, a metric yet. And we are going to use the notify function to add some value. We will increment its value from 0 to 1. And when we go back to metric, sorry, when we go back to Bombard, we will see that it actually picked up the new metric that we added to our node, and it's displaying that it's 1. You can use not only Wombat to visualize the metric that Wombat collected, but Wombat is also able to push it, push the metrics into external tools, for example, Graphite. Uh, Graphite's way of showing metrics is that it builds these nice hierarchies that you can see in the left, and Wombat uses this hierarchy to create a folder-like entry for each node, like React 1 in this case, and puts the metric metrics uh, inside these folders. So if you click on active timers, for example, then you will see the same graph that you would see in Wombat's web dashboard. And now let's see how to configure Wombat collecting metrics and pushing it, pushing them to Graphite. This is basically two lines of configuration. This is Wombat's config file. But you see here is that we say what's the host on which Graphite is listening and what's the port on which Graphite is listening. And by giving this information to Wombat, Wombat will start pushing all the metrics collected to this address. So this was about metrics. Now let's see notifications. If you click on the notifications tab, you will see all the notifications that Wombat collected from different nodes. Well, you will see the most recent ones here. If you are interested only in the notifications of a certain node, then you click on the node, and then you are happy because there are no notifications at all on this node. So let's generate some. First, we will use Lager, which is an open source logging library, to file an error log. Nothing special here. And when we do that and go back to Wombat, we will see that Wombat collected uh, this metric, sorry, collected this um, entry instantly, and it has popped up a message for us and inserted it into our log table 
and we can open the entry in the table to get more information. In this case, there are no more information, but in case of a supervisor crash, for example, most of the information is, is uh, in the box. With Lager, as with any usual log tool, you can log not only error messages, but you can log info or even debug messages. And you don't want Bombard to collect all these messages by default and showing pop-ups and, and everything for them. So what Bombard does is that it starts on the warning level and by default collects entries above that level. So when I send an info entry here, nothing will be collected by Bombard. But if I think that there is something fishy going on with this node, then I can set the log level to info. I can even click to another node. And when I generate an info message after that, then I will see that Bombard collected it. Right. The next thing that we are going to do is uh, that we are going to generate a real crash. Not just login something, but we have a test supervisor here, so we create a child for that supervisor and we make sure that it crashes. And what you see in Homba is that the same um, few entries that are generated when a supervisor child crashes are shown in Homba. So that's about notifications. The last thing that we are going to check out is alarms. Again, you see all the alarms here, but if you select a node, you only see alarms on that node. And as in case of notifications, let's generate a few alarms ourselves. The most simple alarm is the node down alarm. We simply quit the node, and Bombot will instantly realize that, some, that there is something wrong, the node is down. It can either mean that it's inaccessible, that there is something wrong with the network, or that it, it has actually stopped. When the node is down, Wombat is automatically trying to reconnect to the node. And if we restart the node, then it will succeed in a few seconds. And the node comes up and the alarm is cleared. Now let's generate a few alarms from the node. Let's start with a built-in alarm. Um, this alarm, so, so we have an alarm when the atom table is almost filled in. So let's generate a bunch of atoms. Yeah, first I made a typo, I forgot the first parameter. But the second time we will actually generate a bunch of atoms. And when we go back to Bombat, we'll get a new alarm. And these are the kinds of alarms that Francesco said that operators should uh, uh, be aware of, because even if this doesn't cause the node to crash now, it allows them to prevent failures in the future. And finally, let's use the built-in mechanism of Elang OTP to create an alarm. After creating an alarm, it's collected by Bombat. Alarms are different from notifications because they can also be cleared. So when the application on the node that raised the alarm thinks that this is no longer a problem, the error is not, no longer uh, valid on the system, it can clear the alarm. And in Bombat, we will see that, yes, the alarm is cleared. So thank you for listening to the, for reviewing the demo. Um, Francesco, let's wrap up. Uh, let's mm. discuss the roadmap. Absolutely. So show my screen. So very quickly, just to wrap up, we've got the roadmap, um, which is coming. And, you know, what we're doing right now is um, integrating with standard, you know, integrating, um, one back with standard monitoring tools. So we've got the alarms in place, we've got the metrics, uh, and we've got notifications. 
we're looking at uh, you know, standard tools such as Zabbix and Nagios, um, looking at interfaces towards you know, OEM software as a service providers, and I'm thinking Datadog here, uh, we're thinking New Relic, you know, Splunk, Logly, and others, as well as adding an SNMP interface, which, um, which uh, you know, will allow us to, you know, we already are interfacing Cacti for the REST API, but this will allow us to actually start pushing um, metrics to Cacti. And you know, be able to start using other tools such as HP OpenView and you know, standard alarming tools. We have you know, today um, you know, system metrics, alarms, and notifications for SASL, for OSMON, Lager, uh, Elarm, Exometer, and Folsom. But you know, throughout the remainder of this year and you know, next year, we'll be adding many more new uh, plugins for specific OTP applications. And you know, Nisia is the first one in line. We're looking at different C MySQL, Postgres, and other database drivers. And it would be really great to monitor connectivity towards these databases, uh, the latency of those requests, as well as yeah, get notifications when uh, you know, the state and links are changed. You know, Calvo is another one which uh, our customers have requested. And you know, both integration with standard monitoring tools and new plugins for OTP applications are very much customer driven. So if there's something which is not on here, but you're interested in it, get in touch and let us know. Another area which we're focusing on is looking at plugins for existing out of the box um, OTP applications. So looking at, for example, React, RabbitMQ, uh, Mongoose IM, eJabberD, and CouchDB. It, it would be great to start receiving alarms metrics which are specific and notifications specific to these systems as well as the ability to you know, do operations on these systems. Uh, from the operations point of view, um, we are you know, on the roadmap, we're looking at integrating tools such as ETOP, PMAN, Atmon, uh, all in the dashboard. So when you drill down to a particular node, you're then able to go in and you know, visualize you know, the, the state of those nodes um, you know, through, through the tools which uh, we couldn't previously access for a web-based interface. We're looking at configuration management, you know, how do you deal with configuration across a cluster of airline nodes? You want to change an environment variable of one node. How do you ensure it's propagated across all nodes? Uh, and, you know, how do you monitor environment variables which have to be the same across the cluster? We're looking at live tracing and profiling, you know, the ability to go in and start generating your know, trace events on, on particular parts and actually going in and measuring latency of certain functions and particular functions. So that you know, once your system's gone live, you can turn on the profiler and get the feedback over you know, where you're actually spending your time. Uh, early next year, um, orchestration will no longer be in beta. Uh, you can today you know, deploy um, airline-based systems to hybrid cloud, but it, you know, we're looking at you know, making that as a you know, feature, bringing it in 1.0 and making it a feature of Wombat, as well as start investigating and implementing automated software upgrades. So how do we actually, you know, through the Wombat interface, go in and start visualizing your software upgrade procedure and simplifying it, reducing a lot of the manual errors which stay up here. And you know, towards the middle of next year, uh, all into 2006, we're looking at the rules-based engine. We've got full visibility over what's happening in your airline systems today. And what we want to do is a trigger-based system with a rules-based engine, and this trigger-based system will be running with its own DSL. So I think you know, my favorite example of what we're trying to achieve is you're monitoring airline nodes of a particular type, and you're noticing that they're running at 100% CPU and have been doing so for the last hour or so, or yeah, even last two, three minutes. So automatically, you know, what Wombat will do is go in and deploy a new system on you know, Rackspace or Amazon, and deploy a new node, reconfigure the load balancers, and you know, start offloading load to them. And if you know, that node starts running at 100% CPU, you could, in theory, you know, add another node. And um, you know, if that doesn't resolve the problem, you know, send out a notification and you know, get someone out of bed to go in and start visualizing, looking at the issue itself. You know, another example is you start getting a, an alarm telling you that 80% of your disk is full. You automatically go in into logger and reduce you know, the wraparound time of your logs and possibly go in and start compressing some of your logs. You hit 90% disk full alarm 
uh, you start deleting some of the logs you know you don't need. So this is the roadmap for the next, uh, well, next uh, year and a half at least, but very much customer driven and you know, very much there to address the needs you know, we've managed to gather um, from our clients. So any questions? Shama, you don't, do you have anything to add? Have I missed anything in the roadmap? No, no, no. Okay, you're threatening, you need to do all this work. <laughs> yeah. so, so we've got a whole team in Budapest working on Wombat um, on it, so he's not alone. Francesco, Francesco and yes. Chaba, thank you very much for an inspiring talk on uh, Wombat, and I'm sure the audience will join me in uh, thanking you for that. Now, I'm glad to say that we've received a large number of questions from the audience uh, throughout the duration of the webinar, and uh, given the few available minutes, we will be able to answer perhaps five or six of those questions. The remainder we will answer via email uh, following the, the webinar. So without any further ado, the first question coming from Dominic, uh, it's quite an interesting one, referring to the appropriate tuning of the use of Wombat. So what Dominic is basically saying in summary is that it's, of course, in a perfect world, ideal to you know monitor as much as you can and see all the sort of errors and issues as, as they are starting to develop. The problem is, if you start over-monitoring, then you're obviously influencing the performance of the application itself. So Dominic is asking, how do you find the right balance between over-monitoring and under-monitoring with use of Wombat? So there is no one-size-fits-all. And you never know when you're going to need that information until after the event has happened. So um, what you can do is you can actually configure all of the individual items that you monitor to, you know, on, on a persistent basis. So if you want to get your process numbers you know, once a minute, you do that once a minute. Or you, know, you need to get it every you know, couple of seconds, you get it every couple of seconds. So that's down on a per metric granularity. And, you know, to add to that, um, you know, this is something which, in, you know, in the future can also be automated, um, you know, from one system to another. Now, a lot of these metrics are there because, yeah, we know that we need them at some stage or another. And the idea that, you know, when we later on start creating a trigger-based system, you know, th they will actually help move this forward. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, yeah. Chava, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, yeah. An idea that came to my mind is uh, um, that as they say that the first rule of optimization is that you have to measure. Because before you measure, you don't know what, which is a part of the code that you need to optimize. So maybe a similar approach should be taken here that um, if you decide that you can give, let's say, 2, 3 or 5 percent of your performance from your uh, production node um, in order to get the visibility that Wombat provides, then you can select as many metrics uh, and, and alarms and whatever so that you, you get the most of what you, you think you are able to, to give. Yeah. And also to add to this, we are actually uh, recording the latency of all requests uh, it takes to gather these metrics in Wombat. So we've got full visibility over you know what's expensive and what isn't. We're also seeing the reductions in in the processes gathering, and you know, picking them up, and you know based on these uh, we will be optimizing. And I suspect in some cases we'll actually have to start adding contributions um, to the airline VM and start implementing some of these retrievals as built-in functions to reduce the overhead they currently have in, in uh, the airline system. I think the measurements we've done right now is that Wombat will take a one to 5% overhead on your system resources, on your overall CPU system resources. But obviously, once again, it varies very much from system to system. Thank you for that. I think that um, just about clears it up. Another question uh, that came from Robert is um, basically asking, uh, does Wombat and the nodes that Wombat is managing need to run on the same version of Erlang or OTP? Would you like me to repeat that? So basically, Robert is asking. No, uh, no. So uh, it doesn't. Um, right now, at least. Uh, well, Shabat, you want to take that right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah go ahead it. because you're implementing it. So. Yeah. So, so what we do is that uh, 
you build and use Wombat running on one Erlang version, but uh, before you actually start it, there is a script which will compile the agent modules. So those are the Erlang modules that are injected into your system. And when you compile only the agent modules, you can use a very old Erlang compiler for that. So let's say that you have an R13 uh, Erlang version, and you compile the agents with that and give them to Wombat. So even though Wombat is running on a current Erlang virtual machine, it will inject these old bytecodes into your system. And fortunately, bytecodes are always backward compatible. Not in the other way, but they are backward compatible. So everything should, should just work. And also to add that you know, the, the only thing which is limiting the version compatibility is distributed Erlang. So right now, as long as this, the version of distributed Erlang, uh, the version of Erlang which you're running warm, but can communicate using distributed Erlang with the versions, then you're fine. We are going to be adding a thin layer um, as soon as it actually does become problems for some of our customers uh, where you know, they want to manage a large range of um, Erlang versions. But so far, we've not had that particular request. Thank you for that. Another question from Becky. Becky is asking, uh, can you purchase Wombat as a hosted service, or is Wombat always stored locally to the client? So it's, it's asking for a bit of a recommendation on hosting versus storing locally. So that's a good question. We're currently experimenting with uh, Docker and you know, to provide it as a service, software as a service. But I think we need to do, um, as it currently uses you know, distributed airline to communicate, um, ideally I think uh, right now running it locally on your machine in your cluster is the best approach. We will be working you know, towards providing a kind of more secure uh, layer from, you know, which will then allow us, a communication layer which will then allow us to start providing it as a service. But you know, experiments are ongoing and you know, we hope to be able to start providing um, you know, Wombat demos without you know, using your know, simple distributed airline, uh, but not a secure connection. So you know, nothing will be encrypted. Thank you for that. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the scalability limitations at present that Wombat uh, is facing? Are there any scalability limitations and what are they? So Shava is working on, on that right now, actually. And uh, I think the challenge he has is to get Womba to scale to tens of thousands of nodes. You want to explain very briefly how you're planning on tackling the problem? Yes. So we designed Womba in a way that um, you have one master node and you have as many middle manager nodes as you want. And these middle manager nodes will be actually nodes that connect to your system. So for example, if a middle manager is able to handle uh, even just 100 nodes, then you can still have 100 middle managers, and then you can scale up to 10,000 node, nodes. Um, so we designed the system in a way, but we still package, it, uh, package all the nodes together. So currently, you have only one middle manager, and that means that you can handle a few dozens of nodes. And what we need to do to scale up is to actually implement what we have planned and uh, provide a way to spawn up many middle managers. Thank you, Java. Thank you, Francesco. Just to try and honor at least some of the questions that were asked, we've already run over the allocated time for the webinar, but we'll try and answer two more questions. First one, um, if Wombat injects code into monitor, monitored Erlang nodes, what is actually the impact of this on the nodes that are being monitored? Um, the, so executing that particular code is you know, a few K of memory usage and maybe a 1 to 5% CPU overhead is what we've measured so far. Thank you for that. Uh, and one final question, uh, and that's all the time allows. We do promise to answer all the questions via email following the webinar. This is quite a specific one. It's basically asking, uh, will Wombat erase lager notifications when the log file is deleted on the managed node due to log rotation? I can repeat yes. that if you like. Yes, 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 it does. Because uh, it doesn't use lagers log files, but uh, it subscribes to Lager's log messages. So 
the instant the application uses Liger to do something, Liger will tell Wombat, the Wombat agent, and the Wombat agent will tell the Wombat server. So we don't use the, the Liger log file at all. Right. Thank you for that, Chaba. And um, we do have to finish the question session at this. Now, I'm sure once again you'll all join me in thanking Francesco and Chaba for a very inspiring talk on Wombat. Uh, many thanks to all of you who have joined us for the webinar today. Please join us again for our next monthly webinar, and we'll shortly be sending invites for that. Following today, we will be sending you a short survey to make sure that we capture your feedback of today's webinar.